Hey physics fanatics, welcome to your lesson on the first law of thermodynamics. Our goals for today, we've just got a couple main ones. Uh, first of all, we're going to define a few terms and talk about the relationship among work, heat, and internal energy. They're all related, but we're going to talk about exactly how they each affect each other. And then our second goal is a little bit more mathematical. We will learn about the first law of thermodynamics. Um, and use it to basically take a series of different energy inputs and energy expenditures and figure out how all those different things will affect the internal energy contained in a system. Let's go ahead and get started. Now, <clears throat> before we can uh, really dive into the first law, we have to go and define a few terms first that we really know what the boundaries are of the things that we're dealing with. Um, so our first term to define is a system. Now you might have talked about this a little bit in chemistry. The definition of a system is a little on the hand wavy side, um, but basically a system is just a defined collection of objects or particles that I am choosing to focus on. Um, so a system could be the coffee contained in a mug on the kitchen table, or the system could be me and my body and just looking at the energy contained within me. Um, or the system could be as vast as the entire planet. It could be as small as a collection of a few particles. It's basically however big or small you want to be focusing on. Really totally up to you. Okay, and we'll practice looking at a, a few things later on so you'll get a, a sense of what might be a system. And then the surroundings then are all the other objects or particles that are interacting with the system but not actually a part of it. Okay, so for example, if um, the coffee in my mug is the system, then the air particles that are flowing around the coffee in the mug would be considered part of the surroundings. Or if I stuck a spoon in my cup of coffee, the spoon would be part of the surroundings. Basically anything that has contact and can exchange heat and energy with my system becomes part of its surroundings. Now, um, as I mentioned, our system is going to contain some energy. That's just what matter does. It has energy in it. Um, and sometimes we may want to increase the energy of a system. We have a few different ways of doing that. Hopefully, fresh on your mind still from our last lesson, we could heat up our system. We can add heat energy to it. There are three main ways to do that conduction, convection, and radiation. Hopefully you remember those three types of heat transfer. So I've got a few examples, one from each of those major types of heat transfer. But basically we can somehow get those particles moving faster, thereby adding heat energy to it. Now that should be pretty fresh in your mind, but if we reach way back to our unit on energy, you may recall that there's another um, term that we have for adding energy to a system, whether that is um, increasing its kinetic energy or increasing its potential energy, hopefully this isn't new, we can do work on it. Yeah, remember? Work? Yeah, it's coming back. Alright, so we can do work on our system as well. We can increase the kinetic energy by stirring or shaking the objects or chucking them across the room, whatever we want to do to get those particles moving faster, or we can move the system to a position of higher potential energy. Um, we can lift it off the ground, we can stretch it out so it's got lots of elastic potential energy, something like that. Okay. So two main ways that we can add energy to our system. One from primarily this unit is heating up the system. The other main way that we can add energy to it is by doing work on it, thereby increasing the mechanical energy. Now, just as a little reminder, when we heat something up, do we say the system contains heat? Or, if it's easier to think about it this way, if we do work on a system, do we say that it contains work? And hopefully at this point your answer is no! It contains internal energy. Heat and work are terms that we only use to describe energy that's being transferred from one object to another. But once we've trapped that energy inside our system, we call it internal energy. 
I know that seems kind of like arguing about semantics, but that's going to really help us out in just a couple minutes here. Okay, so just to kind of summarize this, two main ways that we can add energy to a system, add heat to it, in other words, place something really hot next to it and just let thermal equilibrium take its course, or we can do work on the system. Now, um, a lot of times people will ask, what does it mean really to do work on a system when we're looking at the um, particle level? So an example might be to compress a gas. You know, if I'm pushing in on the gas, I'm doing work on it. I have to expend energy in order to get that system to take up less space and increasing the pressure doing work on it. Okay, but don't let that, that trip you up too much. Just kind of let that sink in. Feel free to ask me questions about it later. But again, two main ways that we can add energy to the system. Now, similarly, that also means that there are two main ways that we can take energy away from the system. So the same way that we can add heat to the system, we can also have the system heat up its surroundings and thereby pull energy away from it. So an example would be if I um, took my system and I threw ice cubes in it, okay? Obviously the, the system is going to lose heat energy by, or excuse me, lose internal energy by heating up the ice cubes. That's one way we remove energy from the system. Another way that we can remove energy from the system is to have the system do work on its surroundings, okay? So we can have the system itself change the mechanical energy of other objects around it. Um, again, I know this is kind of hard to think of, but for example, say I've done work on a system by compressing it. Maybe then once I've left it alone, eventually the pressure will build up so much that the gas will expand and it'll blow the top off of, of its container. Right? That would be an example of the system doing work. The gas is just doing its thing, it expands, and then obviously the potential and kinetic energy of the lid shoots up as it gets blown off into the stratosphere or wherever, depending on the mass and pressure levels of our gas. Um, regardless of whether that example really resonates with you, hopefully you can at least understand that we've got two ways then of removing energy which are just heat and work being done or given off by the system, right? So the same way that we can add energy in these two main ways, we can also remove energy from a system in the same two ways. Now, it would be very nice if a system only chose to do one of these things at once. It only received heat energy or it only did work on another object. But the fact is all four of these different energy transfers could be happening simultaneously and do happen simultaneously. So to help us picture that, I've got a little diagram here. Summarizing all the different possible energy inputs and outputs that we can have interacting with a system. So if we look at the left and the top of our system, we see our energy inputs We've got a Q, obviously, to represent heat being added to the system, a W to represent work being done on the system. Those are both positive values because they're both examples of adding energy to our system. Right. On the right and the bottom of this diagram, we have the energy outputs, the ways that our system is giving off energy. So we've got negative Q and negative W to represent the heat being given off by the system and the work being done by the system on its surroundings. We make those negative because in both cases our system is losing energy, so we make them negative. Okay. Now all these inputs and outputs are all sort of centered around this big well of energy in our system, which we, rep we represent with a capital U to represent all the internal energy contained within the system. Another way that you can think about it, an analogy that helps for me, is we can kind of think of the internal energy as a bank account. The internal energy represents all the money that's in my bank account. Now, each month I'm going to have some deposits into my bank account in the form of either cash that I deposit directly or checks that get written to me which I then endorse and give to the bank to credit to my account. 
So those would be the examples of heat and work inputs going into my system, increasing the internal energy. Okay. At the same time, I have certain expenses. I need to be paying for other things. So sometimes I will need to make withdrawals from my bank account, either writing checks to other people or withdrawing cash that I can then spend freely. So those would be the uh, excuse me, the analogs of heat being given off by the system and work being done by the system. So we've got energy coming in, energy going out. Now at the end, though, one thing we might want to know is with all these different transactions happening, how much has the internal energy of the system changed? Okay, the same way that at the end of the month, I really want to know ultimately did the amount of money in my bank account go up or did it go down? Now there's a very simple equation to help us determine how much the internal energy of the system changed and that is the first law of thermodynamics. Simple formula, it's just delta U equals Q plus W. So delta U, again, delta meaning change in, U meaning internal energy. So delta U just represents the overall change in internal energy. How much energy did my system either gain or lose as a result of all these energy transfers? Q represents the total amount of heat energy being transferred to and from the system. So to get our total amount of heat transferred, we add up all the heat that got added to our system and then subtract all the heat that the system lost to its surroundings. And then W represents the total work done. And again, same ideas with the heat. To figure out the total work done, we add up all the work that was done on the system, all the energy that's transferred to it, and then subtract all the work that was done by the system on its surroundings. Okay, and I know the whole by and on thing is kind of tricky, so you've got to be very careful when you read through a problem statement to figure out whether the work is being done by the system or work is being done to the system. All, right. all of these then are measured in joules because they're all different forms of energy. Let's try this out. With one quick sample problem, you won't believe how easy it is. So a sample problem. We've got some sort of system, 45 joules of heat energy get added to that system. The system then turns around and does 16 joules of work on its surroundings. We want to figure out how much did the internal energy of that system change. So I start off by listing all the things that I know about the energy transfers that occurred with this system. So I know that I added 45 joules of heat energy to the system. I didn't lose any heat energy from the system. So my total heat transferred, Q, is a positive 45 joules because we overall gained 45 joules of energy through heating. Now for our total work done, we didn't do any work on our system, but the system lost energy in the form of doing 16 joules of work. Okay. So that means that overall, for our total work done, we lost 16 joules of energy. So that's going to be a negative. Finally, we want to know how much the internal energy of the system changed. So we're solving for delta U. Now the first law of thermodynamics tells us that the change in internal energy of a system is equal to the total heat transferred plus the total work done. I know the heat transferred and the work done, so I can just plug those in. My change in energy is equal to 45 joules minus 16 joules that got lost, which means that overall my internal energy contained in my system increased by 29 joules. Pretty easy, right? All right. Um, feel free to refer to the first law of thermodynamics practice problems that are on SharePoint to test your skills a little bit more. If you run into any problems, feel free to check the solutions or bring your questions to me in class. Have a wonderful day.